did so. Okay. <laughs> All right. So give me, I'm going back. Okay. So um, my name is Dr. Ashley Wong Kay. Um, thank you guys for being here. I'm really excited to talk about this with you. Um, and what I'm going to be talking about today is PCOS, which stands for polycystic ovarian syndrome. Um, I'm an OBGYN, and that stands for obstetrics and gynecology. So, okay. And um, I have no financial interests or relationships to disclose. And just so you guys keep in mind, this is a general overview. And so this is not supposed to take the place of your doctor's visits or your doctor's advice. So really quickly, um, I just wanted to give you guys a brief overview of my specialty, which involves both obstetrics and gynecology. And I think when people think about OBGYNs, they typically think about the obstetrics um, part of it, which is, you know, when we deal with pregnancy, childbirth, so we take care of women while they're pregnant, we deliver those um, children either vaginally or by C-section, we take care of them in the postpartum period, which is generally about six weeks after delivery, and also ectopic pregnancies, which are abnormal pregnancies um, outside of the uterus. And this list is not exhaustive, but I think it gives a pretty good idea. And then what I did was uh, separate gynecology into kind of two different um, groups. There's gynecology in term that's preventative. And so that's when we have you come in for your annual visit, your well woman's exam. And, you know, we do a general um, overview and exam. We do your cancer screening, your cervical cancer screening, which is your pap smears. If it's due and then management of those abnormal pap smears. Um, we do your breast cancer screening, which can involve a breast exam and your mammogram when that's due, uh, contraception or birth control, STI or STD screening, so sexually transmitted, transmitted infections, and then also treatment of those infections, um, immunizations, and also immunizations in obstetrics as well. And then you have your, your problems with gynecology, and uh, there are a lot of things that may be going on, but some of those problems include fibroids, abnormal bleeding, endometriosis, ovarian cysts, menopause. Um, we do you know, different types of surgery, including hysterectomies. And then um, there's PCOS, which is actually a problem a lot of women face, and that's what we're gonna talk about today. So what is my, did the slide change for you guys? No, not yet. Yes. Yeah, it does did. Okay, so what is PCOS? So PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome, is, um, a complex disorder or condition, and it's characterized by uh, these principal features. So there are irregular periods, um, high levels of testosterone, which you commonly think of as uh, male hormone, and then you have polycystic ovaries. So these are, there are a lot of other symptoms and problems that can go on with PCOS, and we are going to talk about that. But generally, when we're talking about diagnosis, you generally need two of these three things, at least two of those three things to make the diagnosis. So those are kind of diagnostic criteria. Um, those high levels of testosterone can be tested either by seeing it in your blood work or seeing it clinically, meaning by exam. And polycystic ovaries, meaning there are multiple small cysts along the out outer portion of the ovary that's seen via ultrasound. And like I was saying, PCOS is, is pretty common. So it occurs in about six to 10% of women. So what causes PCOS? So what we know with PCOS is it involves a hormonal imbalance. So when I say that, that means that your ovaries are not working normally and they're producing too much testosterone. So your ovaries generally make the hormones, estrogen and progesterone, just in terms of that basic um, knowledge, but it makes estrogen and progesterone. And um, normally they produce testosterone in very small amounts, but in PCOS, um, they're making more testosterone than you should be making. And there are also some hormones that your brain makes that's also out of balance. So there's a hormonal imbalance with PCOS. And it's also categorized by, or characterized by metabolic abnormalities, mainly insulin resistance. So insulin resistance is a condition where the body cells do not respond to the effects of insulin. And when the body is not responding to insulin, the levels of glucose or sugar in the blood is gonna increase. So, um, you know, generally we know 
insulin is what your body makes to control your blood sugar. So if you're insulin resistant, that means your body is not responding to that insulin. And then that insulin resistance can lead to diabetes. So if your body, you know, has this sugar from, you know, you eating and your insulin is going up, trying to get that sugar down, but it's not working and it keeps going up, then your body is re developing this, this resistance. And then you end up having what's known as diabetes and most often type two diabetes in that setting. Now, the exact cause of why this hormonal imbalance happens and the metabolic abnormalities, everything that we're going to talk about, the exact cause, you know, is there a certain gene and, you know, it's not known at this time. What we do know is that there is a genetic component. So we know it can run in families or it can be more common, you know, in families where there are women, multiple women affected. We know there's a genetic component and we know that there are environmental components, but an exact reason at this time is unknown. And we're, you know, we continue to do research. We've done quite a lot of it, but that exact reason is not known at this time. So let's go into more detail about um, symptoms with PCOS. So first I'm gonna talk about menstrual irregularities. So when I say menstrual irregularities with PCOS specifically, what I'm talking about is skipping periods. So generally, normally you should have a period every month. And so with PCOS, what happens is you're not having one any, every month. In fact, you're skipping months, you know, several months. Uh, you know, I've seen it go almost to a year where you're not having a period. Um, and oftentimes women will have less than eight periods per year with PCOS. But like I was saying, it can be even less than that. And so then oftentimes when you're skipping these periods, you're going months without a period. When you do finally have one or you do start to bleed, a lot of times with PCOS, that bleeding is prolonged. So you may be going days, weeks you know, months, but months is a bit excessive, but it, it can be a quite, quite, quite a long time. And a lot of times that bleeding is really heavy too. So it may be really heavy. You may see a lot of clots. Um, other symptoms that may occur with PCOS is going to be infertility, meaning um, inability to have children or become pregnant, uh, obesity, acne, and hirsutism, which is when you have excess dark, thick hair on the upper lip, on the chin, the sideburn area, the chest, belly, or your upper thighs. And it's important to remember or to know that with PCOS, everyone is not going to present the same way or have all of the symptoms or all of the same symptoms. You can have, you know, some symptoms, you may have all of the symptoms, but remember just going back to this, this slide here, in terms of diagnosis, you have to have two out of these three things. And then after you make that diagnosis, your symptoms may vary from someone else who also made the diagnosis, but is having, you know, other symptoms. And I'd say that most commonly the menstrual irregularities is what brings women into the office to be evaluated and then subsequently um, diagnosed with PCOS. And um, the hirsutism is, um, is caused by that elevated testosterone that we talked about earlier. So since we're talking about PCOS, our ovaries and, and our periods, I'm going to do a brief review of anatomy. And you guys probably already know this, but sometimes it helps um, to have a picture go with what you're talking about. Can you guys see the cursor on, my, on the screen, the arrow? Yes, yes okay. you can. So starting from the bottom here, this is going to be the entrance to the vagina. So if you can imagine the external part coming from here would be your labia. So here's your vagina. The deepest uh, portion of your vagina is going to be the cervix and your cervix leads to your uterus, your internal organs. So you have your uterus here, you have your inner lining of the uterus. This is where a baby is. Um, if you're pregnant, you have a fallopian tube on each side here and then you have your ovary on each side and the um when it, when an egg is released from your ovary it's going to travel along this fallopian tube it's fertilized by sperm in the tube and then it implants here in the uterus so when you're looking at this comparison you see your, your normal uterus ovaries fallopian tubes here and this side you see one ovary that's polycystic so again that polycystic ovary means that you're having multiple small cysts along the periphery um, of that ovary. And you can have it in one ovary, you can have it in both. Okay, so with this slide, um, I know it seems like a lot <laughs> and there's a lot going on in the graph, but don't worry, I'm not gonna go in detail with this. I don't expect you to memorize it or you know, know those little hormones and things, but I really just wanted you guys to see that this is what's going on in our bodies and this is what a normal menstrual cycle looks like. So. On day one of your period, that's the first day of your menstrual cycle. 
And everything going on up until your next period is a part of the menstrual cycle. So we're always in, you know, in a normally, Who's with that? normally functioning ovaries, you're, Wait, you're, you're, you're always in <clears throat> some part of your menstrual you're cycle. You're running away from me? And um, this all is going to include the hormones, you know, that your brain makes that's uh, important in menstruation. It's, it includes the hormones that your ovaries make. And it also shows down here the changes that happen with your uterus every month. So generally every month your hormones are going to follow a specific pattern and this is you know related to your you know menstrual cycle and, and somewhat pregnancy but anyways every every month or every month yeah your your ovaries are going to follow a specific pattern in the middle of your cycle meaning in between periods that's when your ovary uh when you ovulate when your over ovary releases an egg and then your uterus starts to prepare for pregnancy by building up tissue that's the tissue building up if pregnancy doesn't happen, that tissue that was built up by your uterus to prepare for pregnancy sheds and that results in a period. And then the cycle starts again. And this is what happens every month. But in PCOS, these hormones are not following this pattern due to that imbalance that we talked about and overproduction of certain hormones. And so you end up with these irregular cycles. And if you're having irregular cycles or skipping months, that means that you're not ovulating or releasing an egg each month. And then that's where your infertility issues with PCOS come up because you need an egg to be released in order to be fertilized and thus get pregnant. So that's just kind of, you know, showing this here. Um, so what are the health risks for women with PCOS? So we talked about that insulin resistance that's seen with PCOS. So insulin resistance increases the risk of type two diabetes. And we kind of went over that cardiovascular disease. It also increases your risk of high cholesterol. It increases your risk of endometrial hyperplasia. And this is when the lining of the uterus becomes too thick. And that can then lead to endometrial cancer, which is cancer of the lining of the uterus. So just going to go back to these, you know, two images here between here and here. So what that means is that, again, every month when you have a period because you don't get pregnant, this lining should shed. And if you're looking at it from this view, this lining in the, in the inside of your uterus should shed. And so with PCOS, when you're not having a period all of these months, that tissue is just building up and building up and building up. And, and it can eventually, if not you know, managed, become precancerous, which is that endometrial hyperplasia or even cancerous. And so that's important for women to, to know and to, and to understand in terms of the risks and depending on what their symptoms are and what's going on. So that's kind of what happens in terms of why it puts you at risk of endometrial hyperplasia. And that also explains why the bleeding is so irregular and so long and heavy because if that tissue is building up and building up and building up and you know it's not being shed, it's just kind of doing whatever it wants because there's no balance. Then when you finally do bleed, because eventually, you know, sometimes it just starts sloughing off. So eventually when you do bleed, all that tissue that was there is now coming down in this just totally disorganized fashion. And that's why you end up having those long, um, heavy periods with um, PCOS. But again, that buildup of tissue because the lining is not shedding is what puts you at risk for that endometrial hyperplasia, which can lead to cancer. And of course, we don't want that. Um, and it's, you know, it's preventable. So um, so, so that's important to know. And um, let me say this, and it's not always, it's not only related to, um, to PCOS. This is just one of the risk factors for endometrial cancer or endometrial hyperplasia, but um, African-American women are more likely to have high grade tumors when they're diagnosed with endometrial cancer. And these high grade tumors are associated with a more advanced stage of disease, stage three and stage four, which is associated with a poor diagnose, diagnosis. So I just say that so that you, you, know, you're, you guys are aware of that. And so it, you know, it may prompt you, you know, if somebody has that going on just to maybe be seen um, a little bit sooner. And then women with PCOS are also at a higher risk of sleep disorders, um, such as uh, sleep apnea. And that's a disorder that causes interruptions of breathing during sleep. So how is PCOS treated? So <clears throat> PCOS is a condition where there's not a technical cure, but there are definitely treatment options available. And treatment may differ by person because you're taking that person's individual history, presentation, symptoms, their weight, all this into consideration. 
And then remember everyone with PCOS doesn't present the same or have the same symptoms. So there's a variety of treatments that are available to address the problems of PCOS and the treatments are gonna be tailored to each woman according to their symptoms, their health problems, whether or not uh, she wants to get pregnant at that time. So the first thing that we're gonna start off with, and this is generally first line, um, you know, treatment and where you wanna start. And this is especially more so targeted at women who are um, considered overweight or obese, but lifestyle modifications is big. So that's gonna mean diet, exercise, and weight loss. And we're really targeting that diet and exercise for weight loss um, in overweight or, or obese women because we know it can be effective. So obesity is a comorbidity that may amplify the effects of PCOS. There's a really strong relationship between obesity and PCOS. And so obesity contributes substantially to the reproductive and metabolic abnormalities in women with PCOS, but about 20% of women with PCOS are not obese. So that's why, again, we're tailoring treatment to the person, to the individual, to the patient, because if you are already doing those things, you have a healthy diet, you're exercising, you're at a, a normal weight for your height, then weight loss may not be um, the answer for you, or it may not help with what, what's going on with your PCOS. And we're always going to recommend this, you know, outside of PCOS, just in terms of your general it health, everybody she should be so different. trying to, um, you know, eat better and have a healthier balanced diet and exercise. When we say exercise, we want you to get you know, at least 30 minutes of aerobic exercise three to five times a week. And there are other exercises you'll do too, but you definitely want to get that. Um, so everybody should be doing this, but everyone is not going to, um, that's not going to necessarily be the treatment plan for everyone with PCOS. And so for women with PCOS who are overweight or obese, weight loss is one of the most, the most effective approaches for managing the insulin abnormalities, the irregular menstrual periods and other symptoms. Um, with PCOS. So uh, continuing with the lifestyle modification, research shows that even a five to 10% reduction in body weight can cause resumption of menses or your cycles becoming more regular, um, improved pregnancy rates. So again, if you're not having a regular period, you're not ovulating regularly. regularly. So return of normal period usually means return of ovulation or releasing an egg. And again, if there's an egg, then it can be fertilized and then pregnancy can occur. Um, it also, uh, that weight loss can also reduce, uh, cause reductions in her hirsutism and improvement in glucose or insulin levels. It also decreases that um, um, testosterone that we talked about in your blood. And so if we're thinking about someone who weighs 200 pounds, a 5% uh, decrease in your body weight is going to be um, 10 pounds and a 10% uh reduction is going to be 20 pounds, just to give you an idea of what that means. So, and that doesn't mean you have to, you know, you stop there, but what they've seen is that even that small amount can cause, you know, some significant changes with PCOS and you may be able to, you know, just do that and, and that be what works for you. The options to treat, um, Obesity are identical to those recommended for women without PCOS. So that's gonna include your diet, your exercise. It can include weight loss medications, but that their use is limited at this time with PCOS and then weight loss surgery. So um, women who are considered severely obese um, can uh, may be a candidate for weight loss surgery. And those who lose significant weight after surgery can see the same things, that resumption of periods, the improved pregnancy, all the things we talked about, you know, to um, reduce their risk of type two diabetes. Now, with that being said, response to weight loss is variable. So not all women have resumption of ovulation or menses. So you know, you may start doing that and you're doing all the right things. If, if this is something that you guys have experienced or, you know, are going through, I, I don't want you to get discouraged because it's still going to be so good for your general health, but it, it doesn't always um, address all of those things with PCOS. But the good thing is we do have other treatment options. And again, for those women who you know, weight loss is not an option for them because they're already at a target weight. Like, they have other options as well. So we're going to move forward with that. So the what's considered first line treatment for PCOS, and this is after your lifestyle modifications, is going to be birth control. Um, and again, remember, the treatment for PCOS is, is going to be individualized to that person's specific symptoms, weight, body makeup, all of those things. Um, and so 
and you, you'll probably think of, uh, generally think of birth control as, as um, a pregnancy prevention method, which it is, and it's great for, but it's also first line treatment for many conditions that women suffer with, including PCOS. So what we found is that birth control is extremely effective for women with menstrual irregularities due to PCOS who are not desiring pregnancy at that time. Um, and, and, and what's happening with, with your hormonal birth control is that essentially it's regulating those ovarian hormones and that causes regulation of your menstrual cycle. It also protects women from endometrial or uterine hyperplasia or cancer by again, inducing a monthly menstrual period. So if you're taking birth control and it's allowing you to, um, to have a period every month and uh, not to get too into it, but there, you know, you can also take birth control in a way where you don't have a period and it's still protective, but just to, to stay with the basics, if you're use if you're taking the birth control, um, and, uh, you're having that regular period, your, your uterus is shedding that lining every month. So it's no longer doing that buildup and buildup that's happening with PCOS. Now, uh, and it's also effective for treating hirsutism and acne. So it's, it's, it really targets a lot of the things that you may be going through with PCOS. And the good thing with birth control is that you have different options to choose from that um, you know may work best for you and your lifestyle or to target a problem. So just kind of in general, going through it, you have your oral contraceptive pills. So you take that by mouth. You have your contraceptive patch which goes on your skin and it's switched out weekly. The pill is daily. There's a vaginal ring that's inserted in the vagina that stays in the vagina for three weeks. It comes out for a week and then you know you start over. There's an IUD or an intrauterine device that goes in the uterus and there's a progesterone only pill. So um, you may you know choose something based on what's gonna work for you. So some people are not good at taking pills every day so they may not wanna do a daily pill or some people don't want anything in their uterus so they may not do an IUD. And then when I say that you may use it to target something, for example, the IUD is great for um, you know, menstrual regulation, for protecting the uterine lining, but it doesn't really help with hirsutism and acne. The oral contraceptive pill, on the other hand, um, also regulates your period, it's protective for your uterus, and it also can be helpful for hirsutism and acne. So somebody who is dealing with that as well as irregular periods may benefit from the pill or the patch. Um, versus someone who's not dealing with that and doesn't want to take a pill every day, they may, you know, like going with the IUD. So, you know, you have options there. And um, the other good thing about it is that if you're, again, also not wanting to be pregnant at that time, it's a birth control method. So you're kind of killing two birds with one stone. And then um, um, it's, it's very safe. So, you know, those are some the first line options after your lifestyle modifications. And then other um, medications to talk about just briefly, metformin is, an, metformin is a medication that may help periods become more regular. It's not considered first line, but it may help, but it also may help lower blood sugar levels. Um, spironolactone can help with acne and facial hair growth. Statins can lower your cholesterol and provide cardiovascular benefit. And then infertility medication can be used for um, those women who are wanting to be pregnant to help them to ovulate. So again, if we know someone has PCOS and they're not, you know, you give them the time and they're not able to get pregnant, we know why it's happening. It's because they're not ovulating. So there are medications that are available like clomiphene citrate or letrozole that can help women ovulate. And we also have fertility specialists, um, you know, that are specially trained um, to also help women get pregnant. And they have a larger of things that they can do, you know, including those medications, but other things as well. So should I see a doctor if I have mild symptoms? So firstly, if, if you have not been diagnosed with PCOS, but you have symptoms of PCOS, you should be evaluated by your doctor. If you know you have PCOS or you suspect you have PCOS, but you haven't been to the doctor, you haven't really followed up, you do. You should see your doctor. And this is due to those increased risk of the other health problems that we talked about. And so when you go to see your doctor, you know, early in, you, you, there may be early intervention that may include counseling. So, you know, talking about what you're eating, how much you're exercising, what your weight is, weight loss. And there's earlier and more frequent screening because if I have a patient who's diagnosed with PCOS and she's, you know, 25, I'm gonna start her diabetes screening earlier than I would with someone who isn't and then also do it more frequently. So, you know, prevention, you know, a lot of times if possible is key. So it is definitely important um, to see, you know, your doctor 
if you're having these symptoms. And there are other things that can occur if you're bleeding very heavily and prolonged periods that can quickly result in anemia, require you know, blood transfusion. So the, the earlier um, you are evaluated and start a, a treatment plan, whatever that plan may be, the better. And, and I'm definitely very big on women um, being educated on their bodies and what's going on and you know having the information and the education to make an informed decision whatever that decision may be so definitely if you are noticing some of these symptoms that we talked about and you haven't been evaluated before then i would recommend that you do see your doctor about that and then that that's the end of my presentation if you guys have any questions I am trying to figure one, out how to let's see. One question here. Um, besides taking uh, the birth control, is there uh, anything else you can use to balance your hormones? Like, besides um, like what, what, was, what did you say? Like, like since it's a hormonal issue, mm -hmm. um, is there anything that women can take um, to balance their hormone besides using birth control? Because I uh, you know, D that wouldn't balance your hormone, right? You said I, you went out. You said what? What balance your so, hormone? No, I'm saying so. Like some of the birth control options, uh huh, are they wouldn't help you balance your hormone? It would. It would. So, um, the the birth control is is hormonal birth control. So so when you think about the, and and when we're thinking about the pill, generally your pill is going to be if we're talking about the pill specifically, estrogen and progesterone. Those are the same exact hormones your ovary makes. So when you're taking the pill, you're just you're taking the same hormones your ovary makes, but it's in a certain because you're taking it every day, it keeps your hormones at a steady state level. And so it prevents that imbalance and the up and down and the craziness that may be going on with your ovaries by just keeping it at a steady state. And that's why it's productive. And then that's how it induces a period. And like I was saying before, which it, you know, you can kind of go in detail about how you can take birth control, but there's a way you can take birth control. So you don't have a period or you can decide when you have a period and all of these ways are safe. They've been researched and they're safe. So it does, it does, um, um, control your hormones. And it actually also decreases the level of testosterone that's circulating in your blood. So that's why the birth control can target so many of the different symptoms with PCOS because it's doing so many different things. Um, and at this time, outside of those, you know, things that we talked about with diet and exercise and, um, weight loss, if that's, you know, something that's meant for you, um, there's not other uh, things that we have now that can control that hormone um, imbalance outside of those birth control methods. I mean, there are birth control methods that are non-hormonal. I mean, condoms are considered birth control, um, you know, but th that's not going to help any uh, with PCOS. So we're talking about um, birth control as it relates, you know, specifically to PCOS. Um, if, anyone, if anyone has Hi. any this questions, Hi, Bridget, how are you? Okay. Sorry? I said, this is Bridget, how are you? I'm doing good, how are you? Good, good to see you. I see just got on, so um, I'm not sure what has been discussed, you know, prior. I literally just got on. But okay. my question to you is, I'm not sure if you discussed this earlier, what advice or what would you recommend for women over 40 who are dealing with uh, facial hairs? Um, so I would say you, you that's something that can happen from different things. So you can have facial hair related to PCOS. And so in that setting, you're going to see your GYN, you're going to get an evaluation to see if you meet the criteria for PCOS. And then if you do, then you can try those things that we talked about, like birth control or spironolactone. Those are things that can specifically target um, um, those thick hairs. Um, there's also, you know, laser treatments that can also be used if you know, if you don't want to do medications or the medications are not working, but um, those dark thick hairs can also happen with other endocrine abnormalities. So if it's not a, 
uh, something that, you know, is having to do with PCOS or coming from a GYN standpoint, then sometimes it may have to do with your adrenal glands, which are, you know, glands in, your, uh, in a different place in your body that also make um, hormones. And so sometimes, you know, you may need to get an endocrinologist um, on board. And sometimes, you know, depending on the situation or what's going on, we may uh, work together with another um, specialist, like an endocrinologist, um, to address what, the, why that's happening or what may be going on. Okay. Thank you. Thank You're you. Welcome. Um, if anyone has any more questions, you can unmute yourself and ask. Um, your questions or type them into the chat. So with the, with the presence of the testosterone, like an increased amount of testosterone in women, would that cause them to also have facial hair? Yeah. So, so when we see um, that hirsutism or that facial hair, that's usually or can be related to that elevated testosterone level. So yeah, if you have elevated testosterone, you may you know, see that as one of the um, the um, symptoms of um, of, of the her of uh, the testosterone. Um, and then there's a comment about birth control; it causes heart conditions in the long run. That is, I mean, there's no evidence that um, that that is true, and so. We do recommend birth control for a lot of things um, in women. Every, but I mean, it's important to know, again, I'm very big on education. So I think it's important that people talk to their providers, be aware of their options, and then everyone's body is their body and it's their choice. So you then can make a choice based on what you're going through or you know what you guys have talked about, about what you wanna do to address that. But birth control is very safe. And before you're prescribed birth control or the type of birth control, your doctor is going to go through all of your history with you to make sure you're a candidate for birth control. So there could be something where you may not be a candidate to use something because you have a history of having a clot in the past or something like that. So your doctor does go um, in detail with you about um, your history and what you know the options based on your history are. And then you have a chance to, to say what you want to do or what you're comfortable with. Any more questions? Hey, Ash, I don't have a question. I just have a comment. Uh -huh. So new research is showing that um, a lot of what they used to say um, when they say Black people had higher instance, incidences of certain things, mm -hmm. we thought that we were more prone. But what they're finding out is that we're not more prone to say high blood pressure. It's, more of lifestyle and other combinations of stuff. So when you were talking about endometrial cancer, I was just wondering if it's because maybe we see treatment later on, so we see more aggressive diseases. What are your thoughts on that? I, I do, I definitely, definitely think that that is a component. And, you know, um, in our community, you know, there has been Definitely issues and, and understandably issues with trust with healthcare, um, or, or sometimes it may be just being scared or having anxiety surrounding what could be going on or what you could be diagnosed with. So definitely, um, I, that, that's why you know I try to stress prevention or seeking evaluation and care as early as you can because if you catch, let's say you know some. Uh, someone has, um, you know, this heavy bleeding or, or they have, they haven't been having periods for months or they're postmenopausal and then they see bleeding. And then this has nothing to do with PCOS, but by the way, if you have gone through menopause, you should not ever have a period again. Even if you think it's light, if you are, if you have hit menopause, meaning you haven't had a period for over a year, and this is as a relationship really to endometrial cancer. If you have not had a period for a year or more, that's considered menopause. After that point, you should not have any periods. Some people will say, oh yeah, I just had a, 
you know, real light period, 10 years after menopause, that's not in any situation normal. So if that happens, you need to get seen right away because that is a symptom of endometrial cancer. But yeah, so if you, um, you know, get in as soon as something is going on, your evaluation, you may catch something before it gets to that advanced stage. You may catch it when it's just endometrial hyperplasia, which is curable, you know, which is treatable versus when it gets to a point where it's spread to other parts of your body. So I definitely do agree on that. I do agree that, um, you know, lifestyle is big. What you eat is important and that, that does play a huge role. And there are some things that, you know, medicine is something that's continuously changing and we don't know everything. We don't know, you know, every single thing about our body or even our specialty. So there's always some, you know, unknown things. So we may not know how much um, something helps, but we know at this point, at least we know how important diet is. We know how important exercise is. We know how obesity can have so many negative effects on our body in different ways outside of PCOS or bleeding. And so prevention, I think is if, if possible is key and seeking care early is definitely key. And so, you know, it's good to find a doctor that you, you know, can trust and that you can communicate well with. That's really important. At what age do you bring your, if you have a daughter, at what age do you start bringing your daughter to the GYN to make sure that they're on the right path of taking care of themselves in this area? Um, there's not an exact age, but you can start, you know, in, you can start bringing your, your daughter to get at least even an introduction to care when they're 13, 14, 15, 12. I, you know, I've seen patients that are 10, you know, because once you start your period, it's not uncommon for, um, you know, girls to have a lot of irregularities with their period. And that's usually more so due to the immaturity of just the way their brain talks to their ovaries and how their ovaries talk to the uterus. That whole axis can be very immature. So a lot of time, young, a lot of times young girls have, you know, irregularities with their periods, or um, even if that's not an issue, you can have no, um, you may have a daughter who's not having any issues, but it's, it's, it's a good idea. It's not a bad idea at all to, you know, we recommend it, you know, start bringing them in around 13, 14, just to have an introduction. That does not mean that they're having a pelvic exam. That is, they, I, you know, I have visits sometimes with young girls where we just sit and we just talk because you do have to, develop a relationship and trust. And especially when you're younger, you're, you know, we can all remember what it was like when we were younger, you're so, you know, nervous and you may be embarrassed about your body. So, um, so a lot of times you may just be having conversations with them, but the, the conversations are important. And, and some moms may not be comfortable talking about certain things with their daughters. And if that's the, if that's the case, and you're more comfortable bringing them to an OBGYN that you trust, you can, that's perfectly fine just to even say, hey, let's just do a review of your history and talk about this, this or that. So, you know, I've had these kind of kind of conversations with young girls quite often. So that's probably around an average age, but it can definitely be earlier. Um, if they're having issues, it can be later. Um, but but that's something that you can definitely do. Are you taking new patients? Uh, um, I um am in North Carolina and no, unfortunately, but that's only because I'm, I'm in transition in terms of moving. So I'm going to be moving pretty soon, but, but when I move, I, I should be, <laughs> but that may be, uh, that, that may be in, in a few months. Okay. All right. So, uh, doc, to one K, if you just want to just go ahead and do a recap, we're almost, um, at our time limit to just do a recap of what we went over for those who came on late and may have missed anything about um, the P about PSCOS. Yeah. PCS. Okay, so uh, do you want me to bring up the slides again or just? No, 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 you could just go okay. ahead and do a recap. Okay, so, so again, just really quick, PCOS stands for polycystic ovarian syndrome. It's generally characterized by irregular periods, um, high levels of testosterone and, and polycystic ovaries, although you may not have all three, you need two out of three to be diagnosed. And then your other symptoms or you know, things that you may notice that um, are symptoms of PCOS 
include those menstrual irregularities. So you're skipping long periods, skipping months without having a period, infertility, obesity, acne, hirsutism, which are those thick, dark hairs. Um, and um, there is association with PCOS and, and, and um, diabetes, uh, heart disease, um, high cholesterol, endometrial cancer. And so uh, there are treatment options for PCOS, especially um, women who are considered overweight or obese. Definitely for everyone, diet and exercise, but weight loss, if you're in that category, that can improve a lot of the symptoms of PCOS. And then there are other, um, other options outside if lifestyle modifications or if weight loss um, has not worked or you're not you know, a, a candidate for that. There are other um, options, including birth control and there are other medications to specifically address what your specific symptom is. So if your symptom is acne, you can specifically address that. If your symptom is those thick hairs, um, you can address that. Um, and if you're having any of those symptoms now and you've uh, never been evaluated, I, I definitely highly recommend you see uh, your OBGYN or if you don't have one, find one. Um, if you have a primary care doctor, that's a good place to start. Some primary care doctors might start, um, you know, it all depends on their comfort, but they may start an evaluation or get some things ordered and they definitely can uh, give a referral to a GYN if you don't have one. Awesome. awesome. There, last question. Is there a network that exists of Black women OBGYN? Um, um, that's a good question. I'm not aware of if there's a network. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if there was one on Facebook. I know Facebook has a lot of groups, but I haven't really been on there. Um, but as far as I know, um, I don't think that there is a... Um, like a, a community where you could specifically look it up, but but generally you can look up uh, the doctor, and um, you know you can go by your insurance and and the providers that your insurance covers, and from there you can probably look them up, and um, you know most times you'll find a picture uh, on Google or something like that. That is true. Oh, just one last question. I, I mean, I know you touched uh, that folks when women miss their period. So if just for those, because I noticed that someone just joined not too long ago. So if we have young girls, women within a certain age range that you miss your period, say one month, it didn't come two months later, then it comes two months after that, you're on the path to having this particular. Um, well, not necessarily. Um... Uh, so it, it can depend on different things. And that's why, you know, if you think there's something going on, I'd rather you just go in and get seen and they say, hey, this is not, you know, because when you, when a patient comes in and they say, this is what's going on, I'm going to get a very detailed history. So we're going to talk about your periods for the last year plus. We're going to go, you know, when did your period, how old were you when your period started? How long, you know, how many days your periods last? What are your, what, what's your bleeding like? Um, but Again, generally younger patients, uh, like when you're around the first years of starting your period, um, your periods tend to be more irregular. So that may not be that. It may just be, again, that immature axis of the hormones kind of getting to a regular uh, point in your body. Um, and then sometimes you can skip a period for something unrelated to this. Sometimes, you know, stress can be a big uh, play a, a big role in a lot of things. So sometimes you can have a, you know, ex uh, extremely stressful period and skip a period because of that. Or, you know, if someone is a, a, a highly skilled athlete and they have a lot of muscle and less fat content, sometimes that can cause a difference in period. So you got to look at everything with the person. And this is just one of the things that uh, where you see menstrual irregularities, you can also have menstrual irregularities from lots of other different things, including, um, you know, thyroid issues. So if it's a thyroid issue, and that's usually part of even uh, the GYN evaluation, we're going to kind of test all of those things. So if I look, if I'm, you know, noticing that you're telling me about your periods, and it's definitely irregular. Um, one of the things I'm going to test, for example, is your thyroid. And if I find that everything else is normal, except for that thyroid, that's your, your thyroid can also affect your periods. And so I'm going to go ahead and get you sent to an endocrinologist because they're going to go start their evaluation and see, well, why is this happening? And do they recommend treatment for that thyroid disorder? Um, so it really depends. Um, and when you, when you 
uh, come in, there are certain things that we test to see if you do, like I was saying, the ultrasound, maybe blood work, the physical exam, all of that, to see if you do have PCOS. So you can sometimes skip a period or have irregularities and it's you know not related to, or it's not PCOS, it may be something else. I'm very forgetful all the time. Do you think that it's recommended that you maybe use an app to track your period or-, or Oh yeah, that- do that? Yeah, that, that's a great way to, to keep track. I mean, you know, we're all busy. We all, you know, people have jobs, people have kids. You it, you may not remember your period that was two weeks ago and that's totally normal. So uh, an app is great. That will tell you the first day because a lot of times, you know, we'll try to figure out the first day. It'll tell you how long your period was. It'll tell you the frequency because there's a normal frequency of periods, you know. So definitely an app is a great idea to just keep track of things, especially if you think something is um, is going on or, you know, not normal. That can be that's actually a great idea because and I oftentimes ask patients, oh, do you have an app so I can look at it? Because asking them about their period four months ago is a little hard you know, to remember that. And then that way we can see what's been going on. Um, and and have a, a, a broader view of you know, their cycles. You know, if you just know about two cycles, that's not too helpful because again, you can skip a cycle and that not be a big deal. You know, it's, you know, it's more concerning when you, you know, you're consistently going months without a period and then having this, you know, heavy prolonged bleeding. Um, but yeah, an app is a great idea and you can definitely share that with your GYN too. I always find that helpful. Awesome. So we are just about at our six, four more minutes before we close. And we just want to just emphasize, we got a recap from, from Dr. Juan K. Uh, we just want to emphasize that awareness is key. She emphasized that knowledge is power. We should keep our, um, do our research on ourselves, self-awareness, keep, and again, she mentions this app. I know some of us are not technologically advanced, but we got to get with the program, start writing down when we have our period, how long they last for, because when you do go to the doctor, we are learning that all of this information is very important in, in helping our diagno diagnosis whenever we go there. And just knowing oh, your, your body health and what, you know, even medical history, Family medical history is key when you mm -hmm. go to the GYN. That way they're more uh, know how to help you better. Um, and then I, I did want to say, I forgot, I want to say this earlier. If you're in your 40s and you're experiencing irregular periods, that's more likely um, a transition into menopause um, than PCOS to be diagnosed that late. But, you know, if you have a question, I, I, there are no questions that someone will come in and ask me and, and I think that it's stupid or I'm, I'm upset about it. I'd rather you ask something and it'd be totally normal versus not ask and we miss something. But, but generally when you're approaching menopause, your periods start to space out. So you may skip one, then you may skip two, three. And then again, a year that's considered menopause. Bleeding after menopause is not normal. If that happens, please see your GYN. That could be a, a, a symptom of, of endometrial cancer. Awesome. So we want to thank um, Dr. Juan K for this very, very, very informative session. Um, we hope that you will tune into our next event. You will be sent the flyer. We ask that you will support, send it to other women. Um, this is about women's health and it's something that we need to have on our platform. I would like to encourage Dr. Juan K. She says she speaks to young children to have something out there where Maybe we can book her to come to our churches to speak to our young women um, about their GYN health, overall health, which is something that most people don't talk to young girls about. And most parents are just not aware of all the things that are going on in today's society. Again, clap hands to Dr. Juan K for a beautiful and informative session. And we thank all of our viewers and our callers for coming on. And we look forward to seeing you guys. We're, about, we're going to close at this time with prayer. If you guys could bow your heads with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the information that you have given us. You have come true. Um, Dr. Wan K was very thorough in presenting and empowering us with this knowledge about PCOS. We thank you for all that we have learned. We pray that we will share it with others, inform others um, about what is possible could be happening with their body when they're missing their periods for a very long period of time. 
Um, we pray that you will bring us back again, help us to invite a friend to our next meeting and help us to grow and be empowered to empower other women to know about themselves and their overall health. Uh, be with us as we separate, bring us together. And I believe the next one is in two weeks and just continue to guide us dear Lord and send your angels to surround us as we go, come and go to and fro, we pray in Jesus name, amen. Thank you, Dr. Yeah. Wonke, excellent Thank presentation. You. Thank you. Thanks, daughter. <laughs> and this will awesome. this recording awesome. will be awesome. available if you want to um, uh, have someone uh, view it at a later date. Um, this information will be available as well.